Hi, and welcome to Beginning Engineers. Today, I'm going to be talking about cost-saving projects. I'm going to go over some of the tools you can use to work on these projects and give some examples of projects that will save money. So let's put those engineering skills to good use. This video is recommended by Hamza Sanaoui. Hopefully, I'm pronouncing that somewhat right. Thank you, Hamza. There are a million ways to save costs and of course, varying levels of complexity with all those ways to save money. In general, industrial engineers or anyone who's looking to save some money should start with low hanging fruit. So low hanging fruit, that's slang for those things that are pretty obviously wrong and generally easy to fix. And the more you work on these projects, the more you'll be able to identify low hanging fruit, especially if you've worked in a few different factories or few different places. I've stressed this next point many times in several of my videos. The best engineers talk to people. Talk to the employees at the place you're working. Say, hey, what are your biggest issues? What are your struggles day to day? What would make your job easier? And what do other departments do that frustrates you? These are just a few kind of beginning questions to really have a dialogue with people. What kind of troubles are they running into in their job? How do they interact with other departments? Do they themselves have ideas for improvements? You'd be surprised what a friendly face and a good conversation can do for your work. In addition to talking, just observe systems for a little while. It's especially good to use the tools I'll go over in the next slide, but if you just watch how things are happening, you'll begin to pick up on the kinks, the issues with the system, and you'll pick up on the things that seem to work well, things that maybe you can expand. Those in operations will tell you as well. It's very important to always keep a fresh perspective, as though you are new to the situation, new to the place. It's great to question why things are done a certain way. One of the great tools in operations is called 5Y. And this tool is used by a lot of engineers and a lot of people in business because it kind of forces you to take that fresh perspective. Why is this happening? Well, why does that happen? Well, why does that happen? People who've worked somewhere for a little while will very quickly lose that fresh mindset. Well, of course it happens this way. We've always done it this way. But does that make the most sense? At their core, all good cost-saving projects look to eliminate waste in an operation. Unless you're designing something or brainstorming a new product, you're not really adding value. To create a product or to follow a process, all the value is being added at some point to create the final solution, the final product. But what makes it expensive is all the waste in between. So it's good to start thinking about waste as more than just a dumpster or trash, physical waste. Waste can be waiting on something to happen, motion that's not needed. Inventory, you have too many things. Defects that prevent a product from getting to the end user. Overproduction, so you're making things that you don't even need at that time or may never be used. Overprocessing, so you're doing too much. You're doing things to the product or doing things on the project that don't really help, that don't really add value. And transport, so you're sending things all over the place. You have a sloppy supply chain. Now these types of wastes are typically known as the seven deadly wastes. And I have a separate video on this if you'd like more detail. They're very fascinating, and if you really focus on them, you can begin to see them everywhere. Great. Let's get into some of the tools used to identify and prevent waste. One of my favorites is the spaghetti diagram. This helps you identify wasted motion. These are pretty fun to do. Basically, the idea of a spaghetti diagram is that you stand around for an hour or two hours and observe the way people move. But what you do is... For every person you're looking at, and it gets difficult or there's more people, so maybe just start with one or two if you've never done one before, you literally have a map of the area they're in, a rough approximation, and then draw a line for everywhere that person moves, literally everywhere, and you don't stop that line. Every time they move, you move that line. And in the end, you have a pathway that that person has taken for the past hour or two. And it looks like spaghetti a lot, because typically, people's pathways are very inefficient in a lot of situations. If you haven't designed the work appropriately, people are going over here to grab a nut, they're going over here to grab a bolt, and they're moving all over the place. In ideal manufacturing or ideal projects, people move very little. They stand where they need to stand to do the work they need to do. I literally have a video for each of these tools, so I won't go into as much detail for the remaining tools. 
time studies. This is when you break a job down from the start to the beginning of whatever the task is. This helps you identify wasted motion, waiting, and over-processing. There's methods to do it, but if you do it correctly, you'll have a pretty good average time it takes to do something. FMEA. This is a risk analysis tool used to examine a design or a process and identify everything that could go wrong, how bad it would be, the likeliness of it, and how easily you could detect it. So this will help you prevent potential defects. Then we have work instructions or operation standards, depending on where you're at. They usually mean the same thing. These help prevent wasted motion, waiting, over-processing, and defects. Because if you know exactly what adds value and how to do a job, and you can write instructions for that and train people on that perfectly, you're going to prevent all these other wasted things that people might do if they don't know how to do their job exactly. Then we have lean mapping, which is a very high-level overview of how your supply chain and processing works. This helps prevent inventory and transport waste, because if you know exactly when you need your product, when to ship it, where it should go, and all the relevant suppliers and carriers, you can help prevent that waste. Let's get into some examples of cost-saving projects. Now, it's important to keep in mind there are millions of cost-saving projects, and without actually being with you at your job, I can't give an actual, like, specific down-to-earth example of how you're going to save money. But these are some general examples that you can apply to situations that you might be in. And if you use the tools I talked about previously, you'll find some solutions. So here are some general examples. Redesigning workstations to be more ergonomic and have the appropriate tools in the appropriate spot. So this is a pretty common one I saw a lot as an engineer. There are these things called load balancers that are pretty neat. There are things that let you hang tools from something slightly above the work cell. So if someone's always using a screwdriver or you know something you can hold in your hand, instead of having it sitting on the desk, you can kind of have it floating above them to the point where they can just grab it really quickly from midair and use it and then let go of it and it's supported there. Or if someone has a job where they're using all sorts of different tools, instead of having them all on different shelves right in front of them, which can still be quick to grab, but may require some bending or some sorting through items, literally just build something that's 20 or 30 tiny cubbies right in front of their face that are clearly labeled with bright colors and obvious signs so they can just reach out and grab something. Ergonomics is huge here too. Put it within their arm span, so somewhere they can easily grab without bending, without reaching, without wasting time searching. This goes not just for tools, but for parts someone is actually using. So say typically you're assembling something and it comes in a box, and you have them just kind of sort through the box and grab the piece they need, or just stick their hand in. If you can develop some sort of slide or feed that will just easily feed all the pieces in where they can easily grab one, that will speed up the job as well. So tools and products someone is working on, these are things that are tiny and it only seems like it's saving a split second or two. And oftentimes it only is, but it's gonna make them less worn out so their productivity doesn't go down. And those little partial seconds they're saving are gonna add up after eight hours. If you have multiple employees that are working in unison in the same cell, use time studies to determine the expected job time for each person in that cell, and then reallocate work as appropriate. So sometimes you'll see someone in a cell take the brunt of the work, and maybe it's not super obvious because they're really fast at it and they keep pace with other employees. But by doing time studies and spaghetti diagrams, you'll begin to notice that certain people seem to be moving around more, or the expected time of what they're doing should be longer than it actually is, and they're just taking on the brunt of the work. So by shifting around the work that people are doing, you can actually bring down the expected time to make a part. You can shave off 10 seconds from your slowest person and add it on to someone who should have the most free time. And as you do time studies more frequently, you see it less as what each person is doing, and you look at it more as all the steps required to make a part. And then eventually, it's kind of like placing marbles into different tubes, you know, or like some place that you would have as a kid you see, okay, all these tasks have to be done to produce the part or meet the objective. Where can I allocate them best so that they're equal? 
The next example would be for those of you who are involved in the designing of machinery or have influence there, but you can redesign machinery to better suit the job. You can add additional machinery, additional tools, or redesign packaging. So for example, one job I had, one of the steps to making a product involved wrapping copper wire to make a coil, an electromagnetic coil. Luckily for the group of us working on the project, they actually had additional winders. Now to run this winder, the worker had to do a little bit of work up front, you know, setting the wire, flipping the right switches, but then they would press go and the machine would pretty much wrap the coil itself. They may have to step in and help guide the wire as it was wrapping, but it was a semi-automated process. By adding a second winder, they were able to produce more parts with the same amount of time. And this is just by adding the same machine. Now, we had an extra machine on hand, so that was no added cost other than setup. But assuming that extra machine saved you a decent amount of time, you might be able to justify the cost of buying that machine. A good example of redesigning packaging would be if you work for a company that has a large enough contract where you can actually get your supplier to redesign the way something is packaged. So as opposed to sending it in a box that you have to cut open and then cut off the banding on the parts, if you can get your supplier to redesign it so that it's just an easy to open lid where you just have to cut one little tiny part and then remove the bindings so that takes less time, you can have packaging that allows you to get to the products you need quicker. Or I've even seen packages where they have tabs that let you pull out a whole row of the part you need as opposed to like just digging the parts out of the box with your hand or dumping them onto a table and sorting them. They actually come pre-sorted in sleeves. Things like that can really help speed up your process. Even though it's not directly related to making your part, things like this add time and these are good areas to make improvements in. Okay, here are some final examples of cost-saving projects. Have the part or parts of a job that take the longest time process in larger batches. Now, of course, this only applies if you do batch processing in the first place. The image to the right would be a good example of a sort of batch processing. As you can tell, they are donuts going into a fryer, and they're moving on a conveyor system. So it's not exactly like they're being all locked in together and fried at the same time, but it's similar enough to the batch processing concept that I think it really helps explain the idea. And again, I've had a similar idea come up in a job I've had. At the same place that wrapped the coils, those coils were also dipped in chemicals and then baked in an oven. The problem was that oven had to run for a certain amount of time. I don't recall exactly what it was, but I think it was like 20 or 25 minutes. Now you can imagine that might be quite the bottleneck because they would have to create all the coils and then bake them all while the next person in the cell was waiting on that oven to be done. So we threw around the idea that maybe there could be a conveyor system. So this would be more of like an instantaneous batch running. It would allow you to just put them in the oven as soon as they were ready. You wouldn't have to make 10 or 12 and then put them all into the oven at once to be efficient. You could run them through. You could officially max out the oven's capacity by making it a conveyor belt. Always have something in the oven continuously. This is also a good example of how you can realign work based on how long things take. So say you have a batch process that takes four hours, like you're painting parts and heat treating them or something along those lines. If what you're doing before is really quick, but the batch processing takes a long time, you can have people prepare a huge number of parts before the batch processing, especially if it's a high volume contract. You know you're going to need all those parts eventually. So make as many parts that can fit in that batch processing. At first it seems not very logical because everyone's going to be waiting on those parts and it seems like you just want to get them in there as soon as possible. But because that process takes the longest, you really want to make sure it's as efficient as possible. The next example is kind of similar to the one in the previous slide. Use 5S and similar tools to improve the time that repairs and change of her tasks take. I always think it's funny. Areas that are pretty well laid out with things labeled correctly kind of remind me of kids' toys in the sense that handles and things are big and brightly colored. There's very obvious and simple pictures everywhere. And it seems kind of funny at first, but if you think about it, it really helps improve things because it makes things obvious and easy to grab so you can grab them quickly and comfortably 
and the symbols are universal and basic, so you understand where things are, they're easy to grab, and you understand what's going on. My last example is never one that I've done, and you'd have to be pretty high up in the company and have a lot of influence to do it. But if you can, it can make sense, depending on your situation. Outsource a part of the job that has the lowest margin to add those resources that are being used on that part of the job to a more profitable area. This is known as specialization. In today's global economy, we're seeing it more and more and more. So say you work at a weld shop and you have a high volume of products you deliver to a client, and it involves welding a lot of tiny metal rods together. Let's say you also cut those rods. You receive them in as bulk rods, cut them all to you know maybe the nine different sized rods you need, then weld them together. When you do studies on all your processes, you find that the welding is where you're very efficient. You're quick at it, you don't waste a lot of equipment and materials on it. And you have a few people do a lot of different things. You have the best profits here. But then you also find that for cutting the rods, it's slow, it's resource intensive, and has low margins. If possible, if you can buy those rods pre-cut and devote those resources to more welding, to going out and getting new business, you'll make yourself a more profitable firm. Of course, this has the downside of having less integration. So you're not vertically integrating, you're kind of doing the exact opposite. You're outsourcing things more. So you have less control and it makes you more vulnerable to risk. If that supplier decides they don't want to serve you anymore or they go out of business, you have those issues. But it also gives you power as well. You make more money and if there's other suppliers that offer that service, you can shop around and force suppliers to compete for you. Thank you so much for watching this video. I hope you now have a good idea of what are some projects you can do to save costs and the tools you'll need to effectively implement them. If you like this video, please subscribe. Have a great day.